Hello and welcome to Rock Paper Shotgun. Matthew here and I've been playing Sekiro Shadows Die Twice and getting my ass kicked. Then my ass resurrects and gets kicked a second time. To help save you this suffering, I'm going to offer all the Sekiro tips and tricks that got me through the first 10 hours of the game. I'll cover how to get the important upgrades, which skills to focus on, some general best practice advice and some boss tips for the first handful of unstoppable monsters. If you're looking for something specific, I've put time codes in the text description if you only want to watch a little bit of the video, that's fine, but if you do find it useful, I'd love if you click the thumbs up and subscribe to Rock Paper Shotgun for more videos like this. Hope it helps! It's hard to offer more general tips about open combat as each enemy has a rhythm and attack pattern of their own. Very quickly, one piece of advice that really stands up is holding block when you meet a new enemy type and absorbing their attacks. This way you'll see what they can actually do. So many deaths happen because you wade in against a new foe without seeing what they're actually capable of. Secondly, when your own posture meter has risen dangerously high, you'll likely dodge away to safety. But once you've got the distance, don't forget to hold blocking again as this speeds up the rate that your posture bar decreases. What I really wanted to talk about in this first tip was a more general approach to combat, namely trying to limit combat to one-on-one -on -one encounters as much as humanly possible. The game is so much easier with fewer distractions. This is where the game's stealth awareness comes into play, as you can use it to catch the attention of specific enemies and lure them away from crowds. Yes, you can use the ceramic shards for a similar purpose, but your throw range isn't as long as an enemy's sight line. When you meet groups of enemies, edge towards them in a stealth crouch until one of the yellow triangles appears above one of their heads. If you see multiple triangles filling up, you can step back or adjust your position to the side until only one triangle is raising, like so. When the triangle fills, you'll have caught the enemy's eye and they'll walk towards you. The key here is to back away if you see that yellow triangle filling with red. This means they're entering an alarm status. As long as you back away, you can lure them to a distant location more to your liking. Or even better, enemies will eventually lose interest and return to their location, meaning they'll turn their back on you, opening them up for a death blow that might not have been possible when they were standing with their pals. Alternatively, drawing an enemy's suspicion and then quickly zipping up to higher ground is also good. As long as the enemy isn't alert, you can do an aerial death blow from above. Just target, jump and hit tack when it turns red. I probably do this way too much. Get into the habit of catching guards' eyes and you can tailor fights to your liking. It's especially useful for picking off guards around mini-bosses, which I'll cover a bit later in the video. And remember, if it does all go to shit, you are much better off escaping either grappling to a higher spot or just legging it back to an early area in order to lose the attention of the guards. Sekiro is so much easier when you are choosing when to engage rather than having to improvise on the enemy's terms. I also want to sing the praises of the loaded shuriken for thinning enemy ranks. This shuriken flinging upgrade for your prosthetic arm, which you can earn by collecting the shuriken wheel from this path by the outskirts wall gate path idol and then returning to the sculptor to get it fitted, is great at picking off ranged enemies and dogs that roam the earlier areas. Weirdly, you can attack ranged characters without alerting their friends even when they are standing right next to them. Just creep towards them, pressing the lock on key until you can highlight them and then zap them with shurikens. It's a good way of picking off prying eyes before they sound the alarm and can also leave guards standing by themselves, making them easier to stealth kill. Same technique works really well for dogs, just pick them off one by one and then tackle their owner. If you run out of ammo for the arm, you can easily buy more at the sculptor's idols. Don't rest to refill of course, as you will respawn all the enemies. While we're tackling prosthetic upgrades, it's also good to try and unlock new arms as quickly as possible, as each can be used against specific enemies and bosses to great effect. After the loaded shuriken, the next two arms are both unlocked in the Harata Estate. It's actually possible to miss this area entirely. To get there, you need to talk to this old lady in the broken house. She's in the village that comes right after the General Kararada fight, which is the first mini boss you'll meet after the tutorial area. She'll give you a bell, and you have to take that bell to the Buddha statue next to the sculptor. This whisks you to the memory of an old battle. Once in the Harata estate, you need to follow the flow of the level until you find guards sitting around the bonfire. Hidden in the middle of the bonfire is the flame barrel, which will unlock the flame vent upgrade when you next visit the sculptor. It's basically an arm that pops out a fireball, which will come in handy against a few later boss fights. 
continue around the Harata estate and you'll get to a road with a gate that connects you back to the opening area of the estate. If you jump onto the wall to the left of the gate, you'll see two guards having a chat outside a building. Cut their chat short with a sword and then open up the building for the shinobi axe of the monkey. Take this to the sculptor for the loaded axe. This develops more combat potential as you learn extra skills, but right from the start it's basically an instant kill on shielded enemies. Just give them a chop and trigger the death blow. Nice! The final upgrade available in this early stretch of the game is the Shinobi Firecracker, an arm that emits a very loud noise that is key to some easier boss wins. The upgrade item for this is Robert's Firecrackers, which you can buy from the Memorial Mob Merchant. He appears in several places, but his first shop is on this tall cliff overlooking the lady who gives you the bell charm that you use to reach the Harata Estate. You have to approach it from this side to climb up, and then you can buy the Firecrackers for 500 sen. That that's three extra arms in the first hour of the game. While we're talking about the merchant, a very quick note about money. Currency is fragile in Sekiro as you lose half of it every time you die, unless you luck out and get unseen aid, which is very rare. One way to safeguard your money is to visit a merchant and buy a money pouch. This item won't be lost on death and can then be used later when you have the specific costs to meet. Yes, you do end up paying a little bit extra for it, it's 110 sen to safeguard 100 sen, but it is worth it in the long run. Connected to this, when you do find money pouches dropped in the world, don't just open them up and fill your pockets. Hold on to them until you need to buy something in mind. Oh, and the extra merchant warning. When you explore the Hirata estate in the memory, you'll find this burglar about to loot a house. Don't attack and kill him as he grows up to be the merchant just outside the chained ogre boss fight. Kill him in the past and he won't have a shop in the present. I mean, that's how time travel works. While we're talking about unlocking various early game treats, it's also worth looking at the various skill systems. Skills are grouped into various disciplines, and you have to unlock each scroll of learning before you can start buying those skills. In the early hours of the game, you'll unlock the shinobi arts as part of the story, and then prosthetic arts when you take the second upgrade to the sculptor. The third skill tree available is the ashina arts, which is a little bit fiddlier. This one can be found after the boss fight with the general on the horse, more on him in a second. You head up the stairs at the back of his battlefield and enter the mansion to meet Tengu. He'll ask you to assassinate some rats. He's actually talking about midget swordsmen who are gathered above the Ashina castle gate. These guys are surprisingly nasty, so I recommend sneaking up behind them for death blows. If you do get in a fight, you can chop through their defensive hats with the loaded axe. Return to Tengu when they're dead, and you'll earn the Ashina esoteric text. The skill trees aren't massive, but they're broad enough to give you stress about what to unlock first, so here are the skills I'd focus on in the early game. The very first skill you want is Makiri Counter. This basically lets you stop thrust attacks, which are those nasty, perilous attacks that are signalled with a flash of red text. This is a great skill because it lets you instantly death blow smaller spearmen, and the input window is really generous. It's also great for chewing through the Shinobi Hunter mini-boss, which I'll cover in a second. I also like the grappling hook attack in the prosthetic art school, mainly because it lets you chew through one of the early bosses with ease. Again, more on him in a second. More importantly, buying the grappling hook lets you then buy Emma's medicine potency, which boosts the strength of healing items and is obviously a huge help at stretching supplies further during more gruelling encounters. It's a vital upgrade. Back in the Shinobi Arts, I really like Suppressed Presence, as it boosts your stealthiness when you are crouched, which gives you better command of the battlefield. As mentioned in my first tip, being able to lure enemies away is so useful for evening the odds. Popping out of stealth is a good way to catch someone's eye, and Suppressed Presence lets you hide again. Once you've got Suppressed Presence, you should also unlock Run and Slide. The move isn't hugely useful by itself, but it does mean that you can now buy Shinobi Eyes, which powers up the power of Makiri Counter. Again, great for chewing through anyone with a pointy stick. Once you have the Ashina Arts, the first skill, Ichimonji, is a treat. A massive chop that absolutely monsters posture. It'll put most small enemies into an instant death blow animation and can really chew up mini bosses' posture too. More importantly, it opens up Descending Carp and Descending Carp, which both increase the amount of posture damage directly after a deflect. Anything that can speed up getting enemies to a death blow is a huge thumbs up from me.
Obviously, all these skills cost points, and points are easily lost, as your XP is halved every time you die. If you want an early boost, and I really do recommend focusing on getting all these abilities, you can grind away at early hours in the game, using the Sculptor's Idol to reset the enemies you just killed. This way, you can earn points from lesser enemies that don't offer much of a risk of death, thus losing those points, and you also learn quick routes so you can do a circuit of the area. Running loops of the first road you reach outside of the dilapidated temple is good, as every enemy can be quickly stealth killed, and there are several idols for quick resets. Otherwise, I'm quite a fan of clearing out the opening area of the Hirata estate. It's also a good way to practice drawing enemies away from their friends for easy takedowns. If you keep running loops, you'll quickly earn the skill points, and you'll also get vast amounts of money and support items, which makes all the later boss fights that much easier. Don't be embarrassed about this slightly cheesy tactic, the game is much more fun with fun skills unlocked. There is really no shame in it. I'm now going to focus on a few early bosses that are the big sticking points for people. First up, the Chained Ogre. There are three useful tricks for this one. First of all, you want to land a death blow before properly engaging the Ogre, as this halves his health for the battle to come. My technique for this is to head to the higher area and draw the Ogre here. Fall down and he'll follow you. You now have to sprint to the top of the hill. You'll get so far from the ogre that the fight will actually stop. The music will die down and his health bar vanishes. This means you are now hidden from him. Now you just have to wait for him to start walking up the hill and you can do an aerial death blow on him. With his health halved, the fight proper begins. This is where it gets a little cheesy. There is a spot behind the fence where the ogre can't reach you. Lure him to either side of the fence and slash at him as he attacks, or wait for him to do an attack that leaves him on the floor. Some attacks can clip you here, but he can't physically follow you onto the ledge. It's a great place to pick away at him. If you want to speed up the fight even further, the ogre is also vulnerable to the flame vent arm, which I explained earlier in the video. Before using it, throw a vial of oil at him, as it makes the flames hit harder and gives you a better chance to slice away at him while he panics. It's entirely possible to do the fight before you have the flame vent though, just poke from safety like the cheese monkey you are. Less trouble than the ogre, but still a sticking point for many is the Shinobi Hunter mini-boss. Two important things. First of all, clear out any other guards from the area so that you can fight him without others getting involved. There are several guards you can't kill without alerting others, so expect to have to run away. I always zip to this tree and then zap to the top of the building to let other guards cool off. Once the four guards in the area are gone, you want to trigger the fight with the death blow. Crouch in the flower bed along the left hand wall, sneak up to where the hunter walks amongst the flowers, and when he turns his back, you creep out and stab him and that's half his health gone. The key to the following fight is to have bought the Mikiri counter skill as outlined earlier in the video. This lets you counter all his spear thrusts and chew through his posture. You still have to watch out for non-thrust attacks, but I basically wait for that flash of red text signifying a spear poke and then counter him until dead. Trust me, with this power unlocked, the fight will seem stupidly easy. Next up is Use Over Drunkard, the first properly nasty boss of the game. As with the Shinobi Hunter, a big part of this fight is taking away his support before the proper fight begins. Clear out the enemies in the house on the left side of the area, and then use the yellow triangle trick, that's from tip number one, to catch the eye of other men and draw them over to you. Kill the ranged fighter with a shuriken, and you can also use this passage to sneak up and backstab the men who wait alongside Juzo. Just be warned that you will draw his attention with this, so the key is to sprint around the hut on the left and hide in the back area until enemies go back to their normal position. It's a bit of a faff, but it's a really safe way to eat through their numbers. When you've killed off his men, you want to trigger the Juzo fight with a death blow and halve his health. Once you've alerted him, Juzo will sometimes stand out in the middle of the field. If you've killed all his men, you just need to sneak from behind for that death blow. If he isn't waiting out in the field, you can draw him over to the hut on the left by letting him see you, then run back to the hiding place until he gets bored. When he turns to walk back to the main gate, you sneak up and strike. 
Now this is the important bit. With his health halved, you now need to get some assistance. Sprint over to the warrior waiting by the rock and quickly activate his text. I say quickly, Yuzo will be after you at this point. Skipping his text brings the warrior into the fight and he serves as a brilliant distraction, opening up Yuzo for lots of attacks at his back. But the quickest way to take him down is to throw oil at him while he fights your friend and then use the flame vent arm to set him ablaze. As he panics, you can do massive damage and drive up that posture. If Yuzo does home in on you, let your friend attack him to take the pressure off you and you'll take this boss down in no time. I actually found the horse riding Gyobu Onowa a little easier than the other earlier bosses, mainly down to two key tricks. First of all, make sure you've followed my advice and have the Shinobi Firecracker and the Grappling Hook attack, both are vital. Gyobu likes to charge at you waving a spear that can be easily blocked. As long as you remain locked on, when he reaches the end of his charge and turns, you'll see a grapple point appear above his head. Hit left trigger to yank yourself towards him and perform the grapple hook attack mid-air to give him a really solid wallop. Be careful not to perform the attack too early though, as it will be finished by the time you reach him. At this point you will now be by his feet, which is the perfect chance to use the firecrackers, a move that scares his horse and gives you a big window of opportunity to chop away at him. And that's kind of it. By alternating between the grappling hook chops and the firecracker, I was able to take him down with ease. You just have to be careful to block as he charges past. Keep your distance so you can spot those grappling hook cues and you'll reveal Giobu's My Little Pony to be a My Little Phony in no time at all. Ah, Blazing Bull, or as I like to call him, Blazing Bullshit. This is the last boss you'll meet in the more linear path of the game's opening hours. Once you've sent this meat mount into the butchers, you'll have a lot more freedom to branch out into the world. The key to this is to sprint. Dodging can get you around the ball, but his horns are wide enough to clip you easily. What you want to do is lock on and then sprint down the side of the ball to get behind him. Quickly turn and chase him. The prime time to attack him is at the end of his dash, you see, so if you're chasing after after him, you can dart down the side and chop at his arse to drive down his health. It also means you'll never be in front of him when he charges again. The bit to watch out for is where he starts ramming his head left and right as these swings can easily nick you. You can also use the same trick as with Gyobu's horse, using the fire crackles to startle the beast. If you do this, don't get greedy and stay chopping at him for too long. Get a bit of distance after a chop or two and then resume your chasing technique. If the fire is really causing you trouble, you can use dousing powder to build burn resistance. Or if you need something with a bit more edge, head back to the Harata estate and explore the pond outside the walls. Here you can stab up giant carp and exchange their scales for a red healing gourd that offers mega fire protection. And those are my tips and tricks for Sekiro, hopefully something there has helped you get by in this wonderful game. It's treating me like shit, but I love it. And I hope these tips and tricks help you love it too. Please do like and subscribe and all that usual gubbins, and why not watch our other Sekiro videos, or any of our videos for that matter. I'm really not that picky. Thanks for watching, and hopefully see you again soon. Bye for now.